Hello, everybody. It's Mike Yao with the Red Sun Role Playing Game, Fire and Head Productions. Um, so, yeah, this video is about, like I just said, it's about the Red Sun Role Playing Game that I've been working on, the Sword and Sorcery Frank Frazetta esque Conan the Barbarian Dark Sun sort of game that runs on uh, D8. D8, D8 dice pool system instead of the D20 system that Savage Kingdoms runs on. And when I say the D20 system, it's not the D20 uh, system that's supported Dungeons and Dragons, the Pathfinder, etc. For the years, it is a, a D20 system. That's all it uses. It doesn't use the other dice. But that's Savage Kingdoms. Today, we're going to talk about Red Sun. So as, as the video title said, we're going to create a Red Sun character because, yeah, I'm at the point where we can do that. In fact, I've created many because we've had... Um, some play tests at the summer camps that I run, and I've uh, some play tests online as well. Not tons of it. I wish I would have gotten more in by now. It's just life, like some, it was a big acting gig. It was just a big theater gig, which was cool and all, but it took up a lot of time. And then some of the people I rely on uh, play tests, uh, they've been busy with stuff too. So, but anyway, we've gotten some decent amount of uh, play testing uh, done. So that's neither hidden nor that. So, the point is, there's enough of the game created to show you guys how to craft a character. And um, I'm going to, I'll show a lot of this. I'm going to be kind of careful. I, I'm, I'm a little, I don't like people stealing designers' ideas and stuff. Um, on one hand, on the other hand, yeah, I don't really care. I kind of want to show people the process. So, I might skip a few things here and there. But for the most part, uh, this is generally how to create a Red Sun uh, role-playing game character tabletop role-playing game. So first of all Here's the character sheet um, As you can see this is a playtest character sheet, which is why it's not fancy, but it's very clean and Which is what I you know kind of what I wanted uh, This is just one I kind of laid out the actually this is uh, a, a version I laid out Was done by my friend Matt Davis who did this kind of version but it was based on the one that I had so he turned it into a form fillable PDF because I'm not as skilled to do that actually I know how to do it I still have the full version of Acrobat which I should in order to do that but um, so I laid out the handwritten version kind of the old school version uh, but this is the form fillable version right here so this is the first page second page is right here these are stippled together usually when I do uh, these are pre-gen pre characters by the way for play testing so that so I've created these myself but um, uh, but other people have created Red Sun characters. Some, uh, several people have that and I've, I've given the playtest rules. So it's not just me that's able to create characters at this point. Uh, in fact, it's been quite intuitive. People have created um, Red Sun characters on fairly skeletal rules that I sent without even really uh, having a breakdown how to of character creation. I mean, not a very detailed one. So it's very intuitive. Probably more intuitive. Well, in fact, yeah, it's more intuitive than Savage Kingdoms uh, to create a character. Although... You could figure that out as well, but this is probably a little easier. All right, so um, as you can see, because I'm not fancy schmancy where I can do the the, the view, the screen shareable thing like a lot of YouTube people do, uh, they would be having another sub screen, right, showing the actual character sheet. So we're going to do it in reverse here, apparently, on camera. Um, <laughs> so as you can see at the top of the character sheet is uh, the various, is kind of your main information right so you choose your um your race or your culture first uh kind of like in sword and sorcery literature humans are by far the most dominant like heroes heroines of the story because the point is when you're encountering these kind of exotic races and or creatures or demons and such and those stories they're usually a long lost race or they're a very rare race. And so to be one as a player character is a kind of weird. However, I do have some of those races created as optional. In fact, in Savage Kingdoms, those of you who have played that game, the non-human races in that game are also technically optional. So you don't have to use those because Savage Kingdoms was originally kind of a sword and sorcery-ish game and it kind of morphed into kind of its own thing kind of a dark ages uh, fantasy game which is fine i kind of like the way it turned out but red sun brings us back to almost more old school so think of the movie fire and ice and frank frazetta art and uh rowena art and julie bell and uh those kind of artists from the 70s and 80s 
very evocative, very cool use of color in their art. Um, all right, so the top has that. Uh, you choose your, so it says, so this character, by the way, is you, it's, I guess it's in reverse, right? Stupid of me. Uh, it's called Kadim al-Rahad. So Kadim al-Rahad is uh, from Zaramad. And it is uh, Zaramad, or he is Zaramese, being from Zaramad, um, is a very Arabic sort of character, kind of Middle Eastern kind of feel to it. You could probably tell by the name. Um, has that kind of feel to it. Again, and these, just a little disclaimer here, because we are in that age right now, this era right now. Um, these are all fantasy races, everybody. This is all part of the game. This isn't supposed to equate to any real life rate. They are kind of influenced by real life peoples, um, but this is all fantasy, right? It's all a fantastical take on a world that may borrow slightly from various cultures, and I mean all cultures. And when I mean borrow from them, that being inspired them, I'm doing it in a respectful way in order to serve the game. It's not to make any kind of social, political statement. So there, now that, that weirdness is out of the way, um, necessary weirdness in these days, there it is. So the top, um, now going back, so see where it says calling? Calling is kind of like your class, but it's not really a class. It's not nearly as restrictive. Um, when you choose your calling, you get kind of a menu of talents to choose from a character creation that or kind of simulate what that uh, race is good at as far as the race goes. As far as calling, uh, it gives you another menu of talents to choose from. Um, and then at the end of character creation, you get 10 points to spend on whatever talent. So in other words, your calling really only sort of uh, influences, informs your early choices. After that, you can really branch off into other talents. However, certain talents kind of lead into others as well. So if you choose some thiefy type stuff, for example, down here, where are we at? See where it says talents. Again, this is the reverse is ridiculous. Um, so it says genie blood. He's got genie blood. That is a uh, blood, uh, at Savage Kingdoms, it would have been called a blood talent. Uh, they're kind of rare, so they're kind of costly. As you can see, the cost was, it says zero. The reason it says zero is because in the early playtest version of this game, um, it's now a point cost system. You get to choose two free talents from your uh, your race or culture, and then two from your calling, and then you had some points to spend uh, on others, which usually would have been one to two, possibly three extra talents if you bought a couple of cheap ones that had low cost. So the reason it says cost zero is because this is from Playtest version 1.0, where you just got to pick. It was a pick system. And now the version 2.0 version of uh, this would actually say cost for Genie Blood, I think, is seven, maybe six. I think it's seven, actually. Um, and then the next talent, what is that? <laughs> hey, oh, my God. Scimitar Adept. You're adept at the use of a scimitar. Uh, that would have been five points. So you would only have 10, that would have cost a total of 12. So that character would not have been able to purchase Pesada Talents in the updated version. Uh, well, I mean, not as far as racial choice. You could have picked it up with those 10 bonus points that I talked about later. But anyway, without getting too far into Talents, uh, the only reason I went directly to Talents a little bit is because it did relate to your race and calling, as I said. Um, Going back to the top, then you fill out your basic uh, materials, your basic uh, descriptive stuff, like your uh, if you if you want to your eye color and hair color and all this stuff. Um, renown is zero. Renown uh, is like in Savage Kingdoms. It is a uh, it's a thing. It's a game mechanic. Um, the numbers skew really lower. Like it's you can it's you can start off with a renown of one at the most, but it's pretty difficult. You have to have like the highborn talent or um, be a member of like an elite organization or something. So not impossible, but uh, difficult. In fact, you can't, no character can start with more than a renown of one. Uh, this character has zero, like most characters would. In fact, this character, the way I crafted this character, he's kind of based on Aladdin. So he's like a 14, 15 year old street urchin. And as you can see, his calling is thief um, because he kind of has to live off of the streets. And you could play this character to be that kind of good natured Aladdin. Uh, street thief if you choose to going down as complications however complications are like weaknesses in savage kingdoms it says lowborn right again kind of like aladdin and 
he's indebted is his other complication, also known, uh, called weaknesses in Savage Kingdoms. I might switch the name complications to weaknesses, but I don't know. I kind of like the fact that they're called complications. I don't know. Um, those are the bonus points you get for choosing a complication. Lowborn gives you two extra points. And then it gives you two extra points to spend towards uh, extra talents as well at character creation. So he's indebted. He owes 50 silver pieces to a local merchant. And so when I was crafting the character in my head, again, he was lowborn. He probably stole from this merchant. And the merchant, instead of cutting his hand off or turning him, turning him into the guard, he actually uh, probably made a deal with him because I think this character is like a pretty good smooth talker. We'll check that out in a second. Made a good made a deal with the merchant saying, "Look, hey, I'll I'll pay you I'll pay you back fifty silver pieces. You just need to give me like a month or so." So that's so he's indebted to that to that dude. So how that plays out would be really fun. You know, does does Kadim pay that back? Does he never see the merchant? You know, try to avoid the merchant again and like risk you know being an oath breaker and having an even worse reputation. Blah blah blah. So that's all the role playing storytelling stuff, which will be fun. Um, all right, what else to see? Tor going back to the top. All right, let's get to these things, these basic um, attributes. Actually, they're called traits um, in Red Sun, but I might, again, change them back to attributes. The reason I say change them back is because that's the terminology I use in Savage Kingdoms. It's not a, that unusual. A lot of games use the term attributes. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons calls them, uh, they call them ability scores. And some people just call them stats, which is kind of annoying to me because all of all of the stuff are technically stats, statistics. Um, so yeah, so currently they're called traits. As you can see, there's only four of them. You have agility, strength, uh, mind, and spirit. And so a little background on how that started, really quick. So I was doing a, I was when I was creating the system, I was I, I came up with these three abilities uh, or attributes called. I you was know, just I, I wanted to go off the model of mind. Mind, body, and spirit, right? And so under mind was going to be a couple of subcategories, and under spirit a couple, and then body was going to be like agility and strength and maybe a constitution type thing. But it just got convoluted. So what I did is just kept spirit and mind, and then I separated body into agility and strength. So now you know kind of where those came from. So those numbers look low, right? But actually two is average, three is what's called an exceptional trait. and a one would be what's considered a poor trait. Four is the highest you can get as like a regular human without some weird blood talent. Going back, for example, going down to genie blood, um, they can eventually max out with a higher uh, one of these traits, I believe. Uh, but generally speaking, four is the highest you can get. But you can't start with anything higher than a three. So, in fact, you have eight points to spend, and then your race or your culture gives you a plus one bonus, um, and, it, and two different ones you get to choose from. For Zaramis, I think they get a choice between agility and mind. You get plus one to agility or mind. Obviously, Kadim has put it in agility. And so, this character is pretty. He's got twos in spirit, mind, and strength, which, again, is average, and three in agility, which is exceptional. So, what these numbers mean game mechanically, this is how many dice you roll. For example, say if Kadim was going to, uh, he was tightrope walking across this uh, this uh, garden in order to get to this palace to, I don't know, may or maybe rob something, um, giving the character. Uh, the GM would probably say make an agility test because that is an agility uh, task. And so he would roll 3d8 and he's trying to hit a target number. These target numbers are called difficulty ratings or DRs. And they have, they're anywhere from four to eight depending on the difficulty. So four is easy, uh, and it goes all the way up to eight, which is um, extreme. Uh, there's even a double eight category. It's an optional category. That's for something nearly impossible. Um, so for example, to tightrope walk on a very, like a very, 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 very narrow rope, it might be a difficulty rating of eight, and maybe even a double eight. So what that means is that's how many you have to, if, to get into success, you have to score. So, for example, let's say he's going across on a decent size rope across this garden. That's probably a difficulty rating of seven. Tightrope walking is fairly difficult to people that aren't trained doing it. Um, so we'll, we'll call it a seven, which is, you know, that's challenging. That's, uh, that's pretty, pretty difficult. 
So he's rolling 3d8 agility. He needs to get a 7 or better. One of those dice has to be a 7. That's called, if he gets one success, that's called a marginal success, which is basically just a regular success. Um, the reason it's called marginal, the GM, if he chooses to, uh, can have some minor, minor thing happen. For example, say Kadim gets a marginal success, so it gets across the rope. However, some minor little mishap might happen. Maybe he uh, lost one of his sandals or shoes or uh, his dagger fell out of his sheath or something, although that might be more into the mishap category. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, if you got two successes, you got two sevens or betters on those 3d8 in this case, that's a uh, moderate success or normal success. So he gets across easily. Not, there's no problem. Uh, if, he would, if he scores three successes, if all three of those dice came up seven in this case, um, that's a uh, exception or extraordinary success. And that generally means something extra cool happens, a little extra cool, because the next categories are heroic and extraordinary. I mean, uh, legendary. So three successes is extraordinary. So maybe he gets across at double speed, um, like at full speed instead of half speed, which is, would be normal for uh, moving at sort of a stealthy um, or or a crawl in this case. Uh, so that that could possibly happen. Um, yeah. So the GM could probably come up with some better cool things as well. And and in the book will be some ideas, some examples of what. Uh, certain success levels might grant. So in fact, in combat, if you score four successes on an attack, that's a heroic success. There's a whole table you roll on for like special effect that might happen. Uh, Legendary also has the same thing. It's five successes, which is really hard and rare. I've only seen it happen maybe once or twice in playtesting so far. Uh, and there's a whole chart you roll on that. So you can do cool stuff like knock your opponent's teeth out or gouge out an eye or something like that and of course you know it could also happen to you if you're not careful so there you go all right so let's go back to the agility example because i was using that for him crossing this this three the theoretical rope um as you can see he's scimitar four what that means is if he's attacking with a scimitar that's an agility test actually scimitars are agility or strength he rolls four dice because he has a talent called scimitar adept that we talked about earlier um, so yeah, um, so if he's attacking, he rolls 48, and I think it's down here on the, there's like a little combat section, there it is, ah, is it even on there? Okay, yeah, right there. Scimitar, it says that it uses agility, it's an agility test. So by the way, skill, uh, they're not called kill, skill checks, they're called, uh, tests in the system. It's not that unusual, there's some other games I've seen that use that terminology. The reason I kind of like that is because I'm trying to make this game... Savage Kingdoms is you know, great and all. I still uh, obviously really love it. We probably roll too much in that system, um, which is fine. It's actually called a skill roll. And the, I think the term, terminology is important. It means that it you probably could just kind of do it more often than normal. A test kind of puts it in the GM and the player's minds that this is like a test. This is like a main thing. This is not like make a dexterity track to like Put your sword in your scabbard without cutting or, you know, something stupid like that, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, the GM advice. But a test means that it's like some kind of major thing that uh, story-wise is going to, to happen. You're at a, it's a crossroads. As a, is it going to be a failure, a success, or somewhere in between? Which I'll get to in a second. Things called mishaps. Um, all right, so dagger, yeah. Da uh, no, scimitar we were talking about. Scimitar's maximum damage is three. Uh, right there, and a dagger has two. In case you want to, so if he's attacking with a dagger, he would roll three d six because you can use agility or strength for a dagger as well. Should say it right there. But the scimitar, he's even better at. He's got some training in it because again, he has a talent called scimitar adept, which allows you to add another die to your scimitar attack. So if he scores four successes with a scimitar, that's a heroic success. But for every point of success you score, is a point of damage. He can only do up to three, though, with the scimitar, and if it's a dagger, only two. However, if he did get a heroic success, he would still get to roll on that table, and maybe he's not only three points of damage could possibly be dealt, but he might also disarm his opponent or knock his opponent's helmet off or knock him prone or break a rib or something like that. So very cool. Um, armor can reduce damage. Uh, I don't think Kadim has any armor. So yeah, he's, he's like a real light. Again, he's like a street urgent thief. 
A, he can't really afford it, and even if he could, it would just slow him down. So he, this character would probably never use any kind of armors that may be an arm buckler or uh, something like that, or very light uh, padded or leather armor, maybe, but I doubt it. Um, all right, so what else? So you've got, uh, what else can I kind of show you guys? All right, so agility, what else? What does it say? Yeah, uh, stealth. Oh, and lock picking too, it looks like. And so that's coming from another talent, some more talents down here called Lock Picker, which gives him an extra die for agility lock picking test. He's got another talent called Pilferer. Um, he gets another extra die for agility test when pilfering. In other words, pickpocketing, pickpocketing or filching would be a kind of a medieval term for it. So pilfering something. Um, so yeah, so he's rolling 48 for that. Uh, lock picking is rolling 48 because uh, it's based on agility. Oh, uh, Skulker is, uh, oh, that's slight, uh, pilfering is for a sleight of hand, right? Skulker gives him the, the four dice and agility um, stealth checks. Then he has another talent called Deceiver. And Deceiver goes off of your spirit. And you could probably see Deception 3. So spirit kind of governs anything that, um, look at it almost like charisma and willpower. Uh, not so much wisdom, but the willpower part of wisdom, or willpower as it is in Savage Kingdoms. So in other words, it's the strength of your personality, but also the strength of your mind and your will. So your spirit. So you can impose your spirit on others, uh, but also a highly spirited person is more likely to resist uh, uh, a social or mental effect. So he has uh, an ability called Deceiver, and that gives him Deception 3. So if he's trying to, to lie or con, you know, fast talk his way out of something, he rolls 3d8 instead of just 2d8 like a, nor a person would do just from straight spirit if they didn't have the Deceiver talent. Uh, so if he wants to try to intimidate someone, that's a spirit test, but he does not get the three dice for Deceiver because it's not he's intimidating, right? So it's just 2d8. He's using spirit to be diplomatic uh, or to haggle. Um, he would just be rolling two. However, if he was trying to haggle with a merchant and he was using deception, like making up a bunch of stories about how his family's starving and all this stuff, uh, then the GM would probably have him make a deception, you know, roll three dice. So up on mind right here, apparently is an ability because it says appraisal. He has an extra dice and appraisal. There it is. He's got a talent called appraiser. He's good at appraising uh, goods, treasure, trinkets, wares, and goods. And so appraising the volume of item normally would be a mind test, right? Makes sense. And he would be rolling 2d8 because he has average mind. So 2d8 is pretty average. But he has the ability called appraiser, a talent called appraiser, and it gives him appraise 3. So he rolls 3d8 to appraise the value of an item or ware. Uh, so going, now let's so work our way up to strength. Strength, of course, is your physical strength. Uh, the trait, it says resist, what does it say there? <laughs> uh, resist something. Lightning. Uh, resist lightning. We're trying to see where that comes from. Down. Let me see. Has to, oh, it's from his genie blood. So when you choose, uh, genie blood, uh, in this case, Jun, in other words, an air-based genie. Uh, you get resistance from lightning, and that's where he gets it from. So, very cool. So, he's not fully an Aladdin here. He's actually a slightly supernatural type of Aladdin with some genie blood. But, you know, I think that could kind of really fit Aladdin as well in the actual story. So, resist, so to resist uh, a lightning or electrical effect would be a strength test, uh, because it's to the body. So, strength also kind of covers, like, and to use D&D &D terms, almost like constitution or to use Savage Kingdom's terms, kind of like vigor. Um, and then in some cases, you can even use spirit if it's uh, like against testing against pain or something. It might be strength or spirit, because that can also be a willpower thing. But resisting lightning uh, is probably a lot more to do with the body than it is the mind, and so that's why it goes off of strength. So if he were um, trying to resist an electrical lightning effect, he would roll 3d8 instead of 2d8 just for the base strength. So I think that explains all of those. And there's there's other things. Uh, I mean, there's tons of talents. For example, if he, he might he might have had mine, he might have had uh, the scribe talent, which would have given him like language three and the knowledge of two more languages. Um, 
He could have had whips, you know, specialty and, and whips run off of agility. He could have had, uh, like a Tolwar, like a two-handed scimitar, which would run off of strength. And there's a talent called Tolwar Adept. By the way, so he has something called Scimitar Adept, Adept, right? Which gives him, he can roll 48 for his scimitar attacks. Uh, there's the next talent in that sort of, the next tier, I suppose, would be his Scimitar Expert. And that means you add two additional dice to your scimitar attacks. So you would roll 5d8 in this case. And then it maxes out at Scimitar X, uh, Master, and that's three D, uh, three additional D8. So in this case, he would be rolling, this character would be rolling 6D8 if attacking with a Scimitar. But it takes a while to get to that, because it uh, each talent of that type sort of doubles in cost uh, as you, as you uh, get them, as you advance or level up, as people like to say. Um, all right, so I'm going to move down. So that I think that's enough about that. So down here, we've got a statistic called Vigor. So if you've played Savage Kingdoms before, that's the name of the kind of constitution um, attribute. But I'm using the term Vigor because I like that term. It's also very evocative of sword and sorcery uh, to describe health. Now, I might go back to calling it health like in Savage Kingdoms and a lot of other games, um, but I kind of like Vigor. The only, the only problem I have with Vigor is that there, there's an, another statistic or ability called stamina and in a lot of people's minds those can be sort of similar but vigor is more of a physical thing like how much punishment you can take you know life essence and stamina is more of a mental stamina mental force mental energy i suppose or spiritual energy as well so uh this character has kadim has four maximum vigor which is average because it's your strength plus your spirit he has a two in each, and he is staggered at two. So there is something in the game called staggered, uh, the staggered condition, just the same, just similar to Savage Kingdoms. Savage Kingdoms, if you're staggered, you're minus two to all your die rolls and your defense and your mobility. This game, it's even simpler. You're just minus one to all of your die rolls. Uh, and def Yes, and defense also. Your defense goes down by one, and you're minus one to your die rolls, which means if it's combat, it's often those might be attack rolls. So yeah, so it uh, you don't want to get too hurt, right? It's supposed to be somewhat gritty, uh, deadly game. But uh, let's check out his defense out really quick. He may not get hit though. Oh, his defense is eight. Is it say eight or six? Six. So your defense is based off your agility plus three. I should say it on there, and comes up with a six. Shields give you another plus one to your defense. He doesn't have a shield because that just kind of weighs him down. And, um, yeah, and it tops out at eight. So pretty simple. So that number represents your defense. In other words, your, uh, your difficulty rating to be hit. In fact, DR, uh, difficulty rating and defense rating, DR, are the same abbreviation for a reason because they're essentially the same thing. So that's difficulty rating for you to be hit. So Kadim six is pretty good. It means he's, he's pretty quick. He dodges a lot of blows, but doesn't have any, like, exceptional training in it. He's just naturally very fast and dodgy. You know, he's street urchin. Um, so, um, somebody's attacking him and they're rolling, say, an average city guard as uh, like 3d8 uh, scimitar or longsword attack or spear attack. Uh, he rolls 3d8. The guard is trying to, to, to fight, to catch, capture Kadim. He rolls 3d8. So any uh, anything, any of those that show up 6 or higher uh, means that he takes a point of damage. So if he gets three hits against him, in other words, an extraordinary success, that's three points of damage to Kadim, and he would be well into staggered and barely conscious with one vigor point left. And he has no armor to reduce any of that. Right, my face suddenly glares beyond the character sheet. So the next statistic that I was alluding to is stamina. That is, uh, that's figured from six plus your mind plus your spirit. So he has a uh, Two in both of those, he has a six, so yeah, ten is the maximum, as it says. That's his max, that's his full. Uh, and then fatigued is five. Fatigued is really the same as staggered, so those two conditions do not uh, stack. In fact, I may just make them both be called staggered. The only reason that I call them two different things is more for a narrative, that when you're half stamina, you're fatigued, like you're out of breath and kind of tired. 
Uh, whereas if you're half vigor, it's more of a physical, you're staggered from maybe blood loss or pain or whatever, or both. Uh, but mechan game mechanically, they're the same. They don't stack. So if Kadim ever gets down to, to staggered and fatigued at the same time, he's still only suffering the minus one to defense, a minus one, not minus two to both of those, because that would be a little ridiculous. There are talents, too, called grit, like in Savage Kingdoms, that you can, if you make a decent enough roll on a spirit or strength test, you can ignore the um, condition of staggered um, or fatigued, because there's another talent that does that for fatigue. And that's, again, that's probably another reason I've kept those two names separate because they're they do uh, there's two different talents that govern them as well. So as you look over over here, you can see uh, mobility. I'm using that same term as in Savage Kingdoms. I kind of like it. I don't really see any other games using that. Usually they just use the term speed or move or something. I think mobility is kind of cool, uh, which is why I'm keeping it. So his base mobility is eight. Uh, mobility, I think it should say it up there. Yeah, it's figured from three plus your agility plus strength. He has a strength of three, again, which is average agility of three, which is exceptional, and that's five plus three, and that's eight. So his walk, this is going to change. This is actually uh, called stride. I don't like walk. It sounds so casual. Uh, it's going to be called stride. It's a little bit more of an active uh, verb. It's a little more a verb. It's a little more description. Descriptive. So eight means that's how many yards he can move as a single action, at, as as a, just a regular stride. Uh, and you get three actions in Red Sun, uh, and and it's roughly a six second round. So an action is a couple couple seconds uh, to go eight yards. And then if he wants to run, that is uh, that takes two actions, and you move times three your base speed. Actually, this is probably going away as well, but I'll just describe it. This is on the character sheet. Uh, sprint is your, is your, your, it requires all three actions and you move at times five your base speed. So that's why it's a 40. Right. So, um, so Kadim is pretty fast. That is not Olympic sprinter speed at all, but that's like pretty good, like standout high school athlete or even like medium to somewhat standout college athlete speed, I guess. Um, all right. So climb is eight. Uh, swim. So the reason those are the same, I'll explain this really quick. So I'm actually going back and forth on this. So the first playtest, 1.0 playtest rules, climb would have been four, swim was four, and what is that? Uh, uh, sneak is would be four because they were half your stride speed. But in this in the second edition, and again I may go back, uh, you just keep the same number, so it just costs two actions. So to climb, you can climb eight eight yards but it takes two actions instead of one. So as you can see, it's roughly the same. It's just kind of half speed. It just takes up two actions. And the reason I did that is that because I wanted to, like, instead of having to make a swim roll or climb roll or a stealth, agility stealth roll every single action, you now only have to do it once in a turn because it's two actions. So as you can see, it's kind of a minor thing. I was just trying to keep the dice rolling down a little bit. So if somebody were to use all three actions to sneak using stealth, they would have to make three different uh, stealth checks. But, you know, the GM could waive that and just maybe just have them do the one. So I don't know. I'm going back and forth. But right now, this is how it stands. Um, besides, it's nice and uh, neat. So climb, swim, sneak. Also, crawl would be uh, another one that would be in there, but it's not, doesn't come up enough to list, but just kind of know that that's what that would be. Right. Um, let's see, what's we got next? Over here, I'm going to switch sides. My ugly mug. Oh, over here, this is armor. It's under defense, this is like your armor. And this is kind of, this is going to be cleaned up in the official character sheet. But it lists any penalties uh, in your armor rating. Oh, wait, I just, he does have armor. He has padded armor three. Good, I can explain what that means. So, three points of armor in Red Sun is not horrible. In fact, I'm not sure why... He has so good because padded armor is usually two. Maybe it is one. Uh, if he's got superior quality armor, then that would add one. All right. Well, I won't quite. Anyway, I'll just use this example, whether it's a two or three. We'll say it is a three. He's got really good padded armor. What that means is if he gets hit for, um, we'll say, two points of damage, right? A guard slashes him for two points of damage, which is pretty bad because that would put him at staggered. Uh, if he rolls, he gets to roll, it says he has armor, he gets to roll a d8. If he rolls a 3 or less, this is the only time you want to roll low. Um, 
If he rolls three or less, that means he, he got hit in an armored area and it absorbs one of those points of damage. So it would only take one point of damage in that case. If he's glanced for one point of damage from a spear and makes his armor roll, then he takes zero damage. So I think it's kind of cool. It's very easy, and it, it really simulates uh, armor pretty well. Savage Kingdoms does a good job with the, just automatically has a number that always subtracts, and that's fine, especially for that era. But in uh, Sword and Sorcery fiction, there's not a lot of heavy armors in that tech level anyway. You might have like a bronze breastplate. You know, you've got some elite guards that might have some greaves and a, and a breastplate or even like even some chain mail or something but a lot of the uh body is pretty exposed um for the most part because it's very costly to make uh metal armor back then or even even like really decent uh leather armors so it kind of represents the period that we're in so uh you you might very just because you're wearing some armor you might very well be hit in a non-armored area so yeah, it kind of works out. Only time you roll, uh, want to roll low in the system is when you're making an uh, what's called an armor roll or armor test. Right. Um, let's see. So and then it lists any. Oh, sorry. Right, he has a penalty for wearing armor. He's got a redo. Was it minus one to spirit spell casting test? Fortunately, he is not a sorcerer, so that probably unless he learns it later, that will probably never come up. So that's I think that's why he's wearing it because it doesn't bother his uh, his overall agility. Uh, heavy armor would uh, give you a minus one to agility uh, stealth test and stuff like that. So he probably wants to avoid that, this character. Uh, all right, what else can I get? We're at 36 minutes. So sorry, if this, I figured this would be a somewhat long video. but So down here in complications, we kind of went over those already. Lowborn and indebted. Uh, what else do we have on the character sheet? There's a whole list of, you know, a whole section for more talents. So one game design goal I try to do here is like with Savage Kingdoms and, and other game systems that are very similar, you have talents and skills and they're kind of separate. I mean, some kind of inform the other to some degree. So I was like, well, why don't we just get rid of one of those, in this case, skills, although they're still here, sort of, um, and just let talents kind of govern most everything. So in other words, going back up here, whenever you're doing some kind of skill, you're always going to be rolling this, but a talent gives you a boost in said skill, like a special talent in something. Like, for example, he's trained in scimitar use. Uh, he's learned to resist point. Well, actually, that's more of a racial thing. He probably didn't really learn it. That's probably just kind of there through his genie blood. He learned to appraise uh, stolen goods. He's learned to deceive the guards and merchants and stuff. He's learned to pick locks uh, on the street. He's learned to be very stealthy and, and learn how to hide and stuff. Uh, and that just gives you boost to these. So skills formally are gone, so you don't have to worry about this big skill list. Uh, but they are still here. They're just uh, just automatically there. Uh, in the in the playtest rules, that I do have a chart of like what when people try stuff, what uh, of the four traits it would fall under. But I think most of it is very intuitive. You're picking a big, picking, swinging a big heavy axe. Obviously, that would go off of strength. Um, you're trying to recall an arcane fact or a fact about an obscure religion. That would be a mind test. You're trying to tightrope walk, like we talked about earlier. That's agility. Or you're trying to, um, trying to climb a wall. Cl climbing is agility or strength, is is how I've suggested it in the book. But you know, you can change it. Swimming is a strength. Um, you could make a case that it's agility, but I think it's a lot more to do with strength. Um, the agility part would come with the form of swimming, but it's propelling yourself to the water and staying afloat is very much a strength thing. Spirit, again, would be persuasive type stuff, willpower stuff. Resisting uh, a charm would be spirit. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Also morale, uh, NPCs and monsters, when they get wounded pretty badly, especially if they're staggered, they will often have to make a morale uh, test, and morale is based on uh, spirit. In some cases, strength, because bigger, stronger animals are going to be less likely to uh, spook, and so that's represented by their strength. All right, so I think that's enough of the first character sheet. I'm not going to go too much longer, because again, I'm actually giving away more than I thought I was going to do, which is par for the course. So, Here's the second character sheet, right? Back of the sheet. Actually, it's page number two, to be honest. So it's right here. So the top of the character sheet, this is equipment. 
uh, wealth. Kadim has 20 copper pieces. So in Savage Kingdoms, I had bronze, silver, and gold. Um, bronze also, I mean, there it was also covered certain currencies that were copper. Uh, I just went back to copper here because doing a little more research on the ancient world, cop copper, bronze was being used. There were bronze coins, but they were kind of rare. Um, copper would have been a little more uh, more in the currency of the time. Bronze was being used mostly for uh, for weapons and other <coughs> excuse me other uses other than coinage. All right, um, equipment and there's heavy loads, so Kadim is can carry up to six. This is a bulk system, by the way, just like Savage Kingdoms, similar, very similar. So instead of having to track every single pound. You're just tracking bulk. And bulk basically represents an item that might weigh anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds. It might even be only 7 or 8 pounds, but if it's, but it might be a set roundish and very bulky. Uh, or it might even be an item that's like 20, 25 pounds, but, uh, but it's very narrow and easily, easy to handle. But roughly speaking, it will say 10 to 15 pound item. So he has one thing that has bulk, one, and that is a... <coughs> excuse me, a... Uh, Hooded cloak. Sorry, as I cough. I don't edit these things, so you'll get the coughing, unfortunately. So I might be going back. So originally, cloaks, a hooded cloak was a one bulk, as you can see, because they are kind of bulky in actual medieval clothes. They're like full body and they cover your head. People use them against the weather and to hide themselves. And so they were like a pretty bulky, you know, nice, sturdy garment. But on the other hand, one might be too much, so I don't know. I might, if I do a half bulk items, thinking about, it might be that. Everything else looks like a zero, because everything else is very light. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you have ten bulk to zero items, it equals one bulk, just like Savage Kingdoms. So he doesn't quite have ten zero uh, bulk zero items. It looks like he has eight. <coughs> yeah, so technically he's at like kind of 1.8 bulk. And he can carry up to six. This will be a light load. In other words, not affected. He carries, uh, if he has medium load, in, anywhere from seven to 12 bulk. He has, the reason it says minus one there, it's minus one all his die rolls and defense because, you know, carrying all the stuff. If he has a heavy load, 13 to 18 bulk, minus two to his die rolls and his defense. So, oh, that's also to a, a mobility as well, which kind of makes sense because you're obviously not going to move quite as fast that way. Right. These are languages. He speaks Zaramese, so I basically list them in order of native native languages first. Um, the official character sheet will probably have more, like my Savage Kingdom sh sheets had, like whether language is native and whether you're read or write it, which I kind of prefer as a little more detail. But for this to play test sheet, we're just kind of slapping it all on there. So Zaramese is his native tongue, obviously, because he is Zaramese. He is from Zaramod, uh, probably from Zinzara, the actual the capital, and just pretty massive. Uh, City known as this, the city of, of sin, actually, kind of the wicked city. Um, then he knows mind speech, wait a moment, uh, whim speech. Oh, right, so he's a member of the an elite, a secret society called the 40 Winds, or not uh, the Four Winds, sorry, Savage Kingdoms of the 40 Winds. But they go back 2500 years to the time of Red Sun when they were just called the Four Winds, and they were basically a kind of thieves guild information gatherer spy group and the four winds represents the uh, uh, the whispering of the winds at the you know the whispers and the fact that they go to all four corners of the the land to kind of gather information they're kind of inf information merchants and uh so they they steal information really more than they do like raw goods although they are kind of known to do that too so wind speech is their um secret language and it's kind of a Part sign language, part words that, you know, mean the parlance. So, secret parlance. Um, and the next language he knows is uh, Galagodson, which is, wait, is that what this is? Uh, <laughs> look at this in reverse again. Galadorian, yeah, as it should be. I was going to say Galagodson is not really a language. It's the name of the, cap the imperial capital of the, of the Empire of Galador. But it's not the name of the language. So Galadorian is the tongue of this big empire to the north of Zaramod, as I just mentioned, uh, known as the Empire of the, of the uh, Four Crowns, and um, often kind of a foe to many adventurers, probably. 
And then the last one is Genie Tongue, and he gets that one automatically for his Genie Blood. So he actually knows the tongue of uh, Genie Kind, which is be kind of cool. This character would be a lot of fun, actually. I think that's uh, like when I'm creating these pre gens. Sometimes I'm just creating for various types and just to try different things. But uh, many times I'm like, I would really actually like to play this character. The very uh, before we end the video, the very bottom just has is uh, oh wait before I skip all that. So all that blank space there. These are this is sorcery, sorcery section. This is where you would list the spells that you know. If you know any type of sorcery, there's seven disciplines of sorcery, just like seven disciplines of magical arts and savage kingdoms. In fact, it's the same ones because again, it's actually the same world. Uh, you have air, earth, fire, water, life, death, and shadow. Um, and it does tend to be called sorcery more probably than just magic. Magic is very generic. Sorcery has a little harder edge to it, and it's it more implies that it's man sort of using. It's almost like artificial magic in a way. It's like creatures that aren't magical in nature trying to produce magical effects is really what sorcery is about, which is why often it goes into making packs with dark spirits or digging up forbidden lore that uh, was not meant for humans to learn. It's dabbling in that sort of stuff. And when you have a mishap in a sorcery spell, some really bad stuff can happen. You can also become tainted eventually or corrupted, uh, that sort of thing. So that's what all these spells are for. Uh, the discipline, this is dice, how many dice you would roll. It's spirit, whenever you cast a spell, it runs off your spirit. So your mind trait actually tells how many spells that you can learn. That governs how many spells that you actually know. And spirit actually is your power to cast spells. So really it's two, uh, two of the four traits uh, govern sorcery. And I wanted that to happen on, on purpose. And uh, D&D kind of annoys me sometimes that everything is always stacked on this one stat, which is kind of weird. So, and then they cry why there's so many dumb stats. But anyway, that's a whole different video. Uh, let's see, what else do you have? DR, the difficulty rating. So every spell has a difficulty rating in order to you have to hit that for the spell to actually work. Uh, and you could also mishap it and have some horrible things happen to you. Stamina is how much the spell costs uh, to cast it. Um, and the range and uh, duration of the spells are all listed right there. So what else did I skip over? Total carried. Uh, there's sorceress and, uh, what is that? Sorceress and strange and sorceress objects. Could be right there, basically magic items. Uh, but that's a little bit more better sword and sorcery flavor text uh, descriptive. So at the very bottom, before we end the video, his personality is uh, energetic, op opportunistic, and optimistic. So, you know, again, kind of Aladdin. And uh, what else did I put? Some of my left blank. I did those on purpose on pre because I want people to fill in some of this themselves. The only reason I have anything at all is that some people, I've noticed a lot of so actually, a lot of people like at least kind of general guidance of the character, and then they'll just add their own layers. And as an actor, I totally get that too. You get your character breakdown description, and then the rest you are you're really creating yourself, uh, and with some help from your from the director. Let's see, little what does it say? Little uh, uh, gods, deities, and faith. Little faith in the gods, save perhaps Zara, uh, ancient deity of fate, prophecy, and fortune. Uh, that's probably the most uh, popular deity in Zaramod, uh, god, god or goddess of prophecy in the stars. Uh, and then it says, other notes, uh, at only 15 summers in age, Kadim is not yet considered a grown man in his culture. So he's actually not technically an adult really yet. So very cool. So that's how, um, kind of how, that's how a character is created and ends up on the character sheet. Didn't really go too much into detail to how it's created. But suffice to say, I did kind of mention at the top of the video that there, like, you get a number of points to kind of be spent. It kind of whatever how many, how you do the uh, traits, eight points. Uh, each race or culture gives you a plus one in one of those. Um, and just really quick before I end the video, wow, this is a long one, but this was a character creation video, so it should be long. You've got this. <clears throat> this is another character sheet just to show you guys really quick. So this is Muganda. Muganda has only an agility of one, but his strength is three, his mind is two, and his spirit is three. It's a very spirited and very strong uh, mind is average, and the agility is uh, a bit slow and clumsy. This is a Gojula. The Gojula are an ape-man race, or man-ape race. 
very cool. And they fit, uh, they're in Savage Kingdoms, but they fit really well, perhaps even better in Red Sun, maybe. He's got Vigor of 5, Stamina of 11, his Stride is 7, so he can sprint 35, etc. And let's see, his talents really quick are, um, he's Dark Sighted, that actually comes from his race, and he has something called Athleticism that comes from his race. And then, He's an herbalist, a club adept, club adept. <laughs> not that kind of club. Uh, clubs and maces actually war clubs. So that means he's just as an extra dice of attacking with a club or mace, a big bludgeon. And he has animal handler. Uh, gives him a boost to spirit animal, animal handling test. He's a life mage initiate. So he's initiate level life mage. You can The best you can start with is initiate. Um, Early playtesting, I made it where you could start off as a adept in a type of magic, but it's really hard to now, and I kind of did that on purpose. Um, and then he's an earth mage initi initiate as well, so he knows life magic and earth magic, and he's a trap setter, which is really kind of cool. Um, complication, he's a phobia, he's a, he has a phobia, a minor phobia, a phobia of fire. He uh, has Savage. He's minus one to like uh, any kind of test to do with engineering or alchemy, like kind of you know kind of more advanced stuff. And he's monastic, meaning he spent a lot of time by himself, almost like a hermit, uh, or a very small enclave of people. And that gives him a minus one to diplomacy and um, like etiquette and that kind of stuff. Tests. They gave him. So uh, the most you can have, and uh, you can only have up to five points worth of complications, so you max out at five. I think Kadim had four, because you don't have to have five, but that's just the max. And, um, yeah, let's see, Herbalism three, Trap Setting three, and then you can see these ones uh, with the asterisk showing that why is it less than a two? Because they are the ones that are affected by monastic or savage uh, complication. And then, um, really quick on this second character sheet, equipment at the top, but mainly I wanted to show you the sorcery because Kadim didn't have any, so uh, this character knows Cure Ailment, Heal Wounds, Growth, Mystic Armor, Poisonous Touch, and Control Beast. And you can see uh, the first three are from Life Magic, the next three are from Earth Magic. Oh, this is right there. Um... It's hard to spell to cast, looks like a DR of uh, five. So not too bad. Several fours are just pretty easy to, to hit. Uh, and that's how much stamina each, looks like all those are cost two, no, one costs three. That's cure ailment, that's curing poisons and diseases. And yeah, that's all the, all the other stats. Casting a spell costs two actions if in combat. And then some spells can be cast as a ritual, which takes anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour, depending on the spell, and that gives you an extra die to roll at the end of the ritual, so a better chance of your magic being more powerful, uh, or working at all. So there we go. <clears throat> That's two characters uh, on hand here, too, really quick, is Ronan. Ronan McClare, he's a, uh, a Garen, uh, he's uh, from the Garenic culture, they're kind of like ancient Celts in a way, and let's see, he's a Scald, so basically like a war bard. Three spirit, which is cool because he's he's got perform four, find herbs three, uh, he's brawling three. He's a bit of a brawl. He's a bit. Of, I built him as sort of a big scrapper. He's always playing in taverns and gets into fights and that sort of thing. And nobody likes his music or stories. Uh, so yeah, that's another one. And then another one I happen to have on handy is Tygen, and he is a Yun uh, from the Yuntillan steps way. Uh, to the north, and the Yuns or uh, Yuntillans are based on Mongolians. So there you go. Thanks for paying attention. That's basically how you create a character I shared probably over much um, and for the Red Sun system. <clears throat> so here's the dice that we use. In fact, I've ordered a lot of these red dice to represent Red Sun. They're all D8s. Everything runs on a D8 system. The most you would ever roll, the most you can ever roll at one time is 8 D8. So if somehow you have a high skill or stat in something, and then you have several situational modifiers that might give you bonus dice, the most you can still ever roll is eight. And I think I've, I'm not sure I've seen that happen yet. Maybe once in one play test where somebody was getting it. But I, I've seen like 78 thrown a couple times. So uh, pretty cool. Uh, obviously, the more dice, the more chances you have for success. So the way mishaps work really quick, 
I might have went over this before, but uh, I've kind of gone back and forth. So the current way of doing it, so it used to be if you got a one on any of the dice without a success, and this is kind of an easy way to do it, you you get what's called a mishap, like a, you know, a critical failure, as certain other games would call it. Something kind of bad happened, right? Um, but it, that was happening probably a little too often. So now the current iteration that we're playtesting is that if half of your dice are ones, that is a mishap. And the cool thing is you can still succeed. Say you're rolling 48 for something. You, um, you know, this right here. And I don't know why I'm doing that. I can't even see it. So 40, 48. Just trust me. They're right here in my hands. Um, as I dropped them over. So you're rolling four of those or whatever. Um, and two of them come up ones. So that means you know, if half the dice or more, or that's a mishap. But the other one is a success. Say so you're rolling against DR5 and you got a five. So you got two ones and a five and a three. So that's one success. And then the two ones means a mishap. So that means you succeeded marginally in what you were doing, but a mishap still occurred. So that's kind of cool. Um, a lot of people like the game system called Blades in the Dark, and it's kind of similar to that, where you have, I think it's called a, mi a mixed success, I think is what it's called. So that's one way of doing it in Red Sun. So you can basically succeed at something and also still have a failure. In Sorcery, it's really cool. You can, uh, like, the spell would work, um, but you still suffer. Like, the Sorcerer himself suffers this, like, horrible, you know, uh, effect, which is really cool and very kind of evocative of some of those uh, stories and, and fantasy in general, not just sword and torture. So, yeah. All right. So, thanks for paying attention. Hopefully, you made it this far. And uh, that's how you create a Red Sun character in general. Things are still, you know, still playtesting, going back and forth. But that's about 90, 95% of it right there. Thanks for uh, paying attention. Share, like, subscribe, all that stuff. I'll talk to you guys again soon.